All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Happy Friday again. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jose Rojas. I'm the president and treasurer of NEPA. And I really want to welcome you today to our uh, July virtual meeting. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, before we uh, move on to the presentation, I just want to give you a little bit of background on our board. So again, I'm the president and treasurer of NEPA. For the past 30 years, I've been working in social, ser social services, ranging from working with youth, uh, the HIV AIDS field, uh, crisis counseling. Uh, in 2005, I moved to Arizona uh, and I currently work uh, as a senior project manager with Mercy Care as employment rehab uh, manager. Uh, I have a passion for helping individuals find their passion. Uh, when you find your passion, it doesn't feel like work and, and you're really, really happy in what you do. So that's my belief and, and I push that and I want everyone to have that feeling. And we have Leah Hill. Uh, she is our vice president. She has a master's degree in project management and maintains certifications as a nationally certified workforce development professional and three career coaching certifications. During her day job, she specializes in and enjoys creating and, and enhancing pipelines, partnerships, and pathways to healthcare employment at the Mayo Clinic. After work, she enjoys hiking, biking, and spending time with her family and friends, traveling, cooking, and building her career coaching and HR consulting practice. Then we have Sherry Zawinski, who's also on our call. She is our secretary, and she earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Nebraska in Omaha. She spent the last 13 years in workforce development, bringing businesses and job seekers together, working with TANF and the WIOA program. Uh, Sherry worked as an apprenticeship training representative for the Arizona Apprenticeship uh, Office as the regional program manager, and now she is with Hamilton Riker Talent Grow, an intermediary sponsor of registered apprenticeship programs as a grant manager. In her uh, spare time, she enjoys going to new restaurants, sightseeing, and spending time with her doggies. All right, then we also have Winslow. Winslow is our social media specialist. Winslow moved to the United States in 2010. Uh, he attended the University of Iowa, got his bachelor's degree in psychology. Upon graduation, Winslow was an employment specialist with uh, Valley Life, helping individuals connect with employment. Now he's currently an HR recruiter with Arizona State University. Uh, he's received his SHRM certification uh, and his MBA. And personally, Winslow enjoys exploring the Phoenix food scene, trying out different restaurants, and he likes to try out recipes that he finds online. All right, now just a little bit about NEPA, if this is your first meeting, just to give you a little bit about our background. We are the Network Employment and Training Professionals Association. We believe in connecting the underserved to the right employers. We believe in growing our community and doing what's unconventional. Our purpose is to bring together our community partners. We recognize job seekers with barriers and challenges, and we like to connect them to long-term and gainful employment. Uh, part of our vision, uh, is we want to have three, uh, about 50 organizations belong to NEPA, receive guidance, support, and direction as we help them hire qualified individuals that have challenges. If you're interested in joining NEPA as an individual, it is a $25 yearly fee. As an organization, it is $75 and allows you to have five participants in our monthly meeting. It also allows you to get on our employer panels, which we hold about quarterly, to let us to allow job seekers to find out about your organization, positions that you're seeking, your culture, et cetera. And then we also post our virtual meetings on our website and our YouTube page for job seekers and community partners and everyone else to see later on. And also you can follow us on NEPTA with our YouTube page, our LinkedIn and our Facebook account. So if you're interested, please look us up and join. Now let's get to the nitty gritty. Today we are super excited. We're gonna do a couple of things. Uh, as you know, we're already in the stretch run for 2022, we're in July. So NEPA will be after our August meeting, we're gonna take a little break and start strategically planning for 2023. So we're super excited about that. So today after Michael Tripp's uh, presentation, we're gonna just ask you a couple of questions about uh, NEPA and your interests so we can sort of strategize for the coming year. 
So let's get down to it. Today, we are delighted to welcome Michael Tripp. Uh, Michael Tripp is a learning consultant and a facilitator. He is also a certified professional coach, as well as a nationally certified facilitator for mental health first aid for adult, youth, and first responders, assist training, safe talk suicide intervention. Today, Mike is going to give us an overview of the mental health first aid training opportunities. He's going to provide an overview of the training, what it's like, what is involved. And then we're going to have an opportunity, if you're interested, on, on getting trained to sign up for upcoming training. So thank you so much. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and pass Mike the ball. Thank you, Jose. Give me just a minute. To... <clears throat> All right, Mike, it's all yours. Set up here. Okay, um, I've just shared my screen. Hopefully you all can see it. Um, and let We're me good. tag on to what you just said about um, <clears throat> speeding through the year, Jose. <clears throat> Earlier today, I had a call about um, my exterminator coming today. So I called them back and I said, I think um, I think you've made a mistake because we're, you're not supposed to come until the third week, the third Friday of the month. And the person said, it is the third Friday of the month. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize you were that far into the month. So this year is going by so quickly. It's amazing. So I can, I can relate. So good to hear that you guys are going to take some time to kind of recalculate um, and figure out what your next steps are at this point. It's, it's a great opportunity to do that next month. So. So hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you for your time and attention today. Uh, for those of you who are, who are joining us as participants, thank you to the board for giving me this time. Um, you're all giving me two wonderful gifts. That's your time and your attention. And, and I hope that you're going to find both of them are well utilized at the end of, of our discussion today. So as Jose indicated, I'm going to be providing an overview of mental health first aid. <clears throat> um, but before we do that, um, I am a a professional trainer. So the, the trainer in me wants to start with a pop quiz. <laughs> so I've posted a question on the screen. The question is, according to statistics, which condition is most common within the U.S.? Anxiety, depression, panic, or substance use? If you've got an idea of which one of those might be um, the most common condition within adults, within the US. Um, I didn't realize we were gonna have chat enabled, sorry about that. So you might be responding in, in uh, questions and answers or you might be responding some other way or somebody wants to um, raise your hand and come off of mute. Um, you're welcome to verbally respond as well, if that's an option. I am watching the chat and the Q&A. Someone mentioned depression. Okay, I hear depression. These are some of the most common, but one of these is the most common amongst adults in, in the US. All right, so. Mike, the next one on the Q&A from Whitney Sullivan, she said anxiety. Anxiety, okay. So we've and got then we have- One for depression, for, one for anxiety. We have two more for anxiety. So we have okay, three anxiety, more. one depression. Okay, very good. Sounds like we might have a very knowledgeable audience because the answer actually is anxiety. And um, that surprises a lot of people who um, attend and complete this course. That's the, um, the most common mental health condition in the US. A lot of times people would suspect it might be depression. Um, I think sometimes we we don't talk that much about mental health, but when we talk about it, I think there's a tendency to hear a little bit more about depression, I think, than, um, than anxiety. Um, but according to a study, a regular study that's done by Harvard, it's known as the National Comorbidity Study, or, or survey, I should say. Um, they have found that in the US, about 48 million individuals um, who are adults um, are diagnosed with some type of anxiety or anxiety-related condition. Um, compare that to the next um, most common condition, which is depression. Depression comes in second. Um, there's about 21 million adults who are, who are diagnosed with depression. So um, 
almost twice the amount of adults in the U.S. are diagnosed with anxiety over depression. So a little fun way to start our conversation. And I wanted to give you two a glimpse of what the Mental Health First Aid is a, uh, course is about. Um, we have these types of discussions. Um, we talk about um, data such as that. Um, such as the most common conditions. And we also talk about signs and symptoms of, of those most common conditions that might be um, impacting adults um, or children or, or youth or, or, or teens or, or various other audiences or populations here in the US. Um, so before I get too heavily involved in mental health first aid, let me back up a, a moment and let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, as Jose indicated, my name is Mike Tripp. I'm with Mercy Care. I've been with Mercy Care for about nine years. Um, my experience in this field, oh my goodness. Um, I started in the mental health well-being field back in 1988. I was in college at the time. I had a great gig in college um, that saw me through. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, when I graduated from college, my intention was to go into to training and into the, the training field. I had heard about that when I was in college changed my degree a bit. Um, it took me a few years to be able to navigate to a point that I could actually formally join a, um, a training and development team. Um, a lot of times we, in today's market, refer to them as workforce development teams. But I was able to make that transition in about 1996. And what's interesting is um, I was able to take with me my experience of mental health, well-being, healthcare, my professional experience, um, and continue working in that field. And I just changed my, my focus um, over to that of training and, and development. So I've um, got a pretty extensive background, in, not only in training and development, uh, workforce development, but also in um, the field of healthcare, uh, mental health and, and well-being. I'm also a member of ATD, which is the Association of Talent Development. I'm a member, contributor, I've had um, about three uh, magazine articles published by them. I've contributed to podcasts and some conferences. I'm hoping to present next year um, at the annual global conference. Um, that's my hope anyway. So um, I joined Mercy Care nine years ago, as I indicated. I currently serve on our provider workforce development team. Um, I, what that means, what, what do we do? Well, we design, we develop, and we facilitate, and we track training. The training is specific not to our employees. There's another team that does that. The provider workforce development team focuses specifically on our contracted providers. And of our contracted providers, we focus even more specifically on our mental health providers. Um, why do we do that? Well, that's because in the state of Arizona, ACCESS, which is our state's um, uh, Medicaid program, um, access has a requirement that mental health providers receive a certain amount of training and certain type of training as well. Um, so I'm on the team that makes certain that that, that training is, is made available and then we track it because we do have to report it to the state. Um, in addition to all of the required training that we sometimes refer to as prescribed training in our field, um, there's also elective options as well. So people have wonderful opportunities to continue to develop themselves as, as professionals so we get to contribute to those efforts as well. Um, in addition to uh, my, my training efforts on the team, um, we also get to assist newly contracted providers. Um, we get to onboard them in regards to all things specific to workforce development. There's a lot of effort for our mental health providers around um, workforce development. So um, we offer a couple of sessions to make certain they understand exactly what are those requirements. So that way they can be in compliance with access in regards to their, their uh, workforce development and their, their training requirements. They also have to submit, um, prepare and submit an annual workforce development plan um, for their agencies. And so I've got a caseload of about 68 providers right now um, that um, their training teams, I provide um, consultation, coaching, mentoring, um, assistance with all things related to workforce development, including the plan that they submit every year. Um, we also run quarterly reports, provide them to the state. Um, and then I also get to contribute to some statewide curriculum development. Um, right now, we're, we've got a huge effort in one particular area. Um, I'm involved in weekly train their trainer sessions across the state. Um, so lots of training, lots of opportunities here. And as if that's not enough, there's even more that I do. I also get to participate occasionally in some community-based training. 
Um, and the reason I get to participate in that is because Mercy Care is a health plan. We set aside some money um, specific to prevention. We refer to that as prevention dollars. Some of it's money that we have set aside and some of it's money that's been provided to us by way of different grants that we've applied for. You know, it used to be in the world of healthcare that if you were sick, you went to see your doctor. And if you weren't sick, you never saw your doctor. You never really thought much about your care. And over the last many years, we've really been begun looking at um, prevention. We've been looking at overall wellness and well-being for individuals. And we realize that you probably should be seeing a professional, um, even in times that you're necessarily not just feeling ill. Um, professionals can also help us feel well, right? And so we realize that it's worth it to have money spent to help prevent conditions as opposed to waiting until a, a condition happens um, and is present and then trying to, to treat that, that condition. So um, we've got a lot of efforts around prevention here at Mercy Care. Um, some of those prevention efforts include things such as mental health first aid, safe talk and assist. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about safe talk and assist first for, for just a, a moment. I'm just gonna mention them. Today's conversation is really not about them. Um, but I think there's a great tie-in. Um, mental health first aid itself, uh, just to, to point that out, that is going to be our main conversation today, um, is brought to us by um, the National Council for Mental Wellbeing here in the United States. I'll talk about them a little more specifically in just a moment. Um, Safe Talk and Assist are brought to us by Living Works, um, which is an organization that focuses specifically on suicide intervention and prevention. Mental Health First Aid, the course Mental Health First Aid does briefly talk about suicide, but it's not really a suicide intervention or prevention specific course. Um, Safe Talk and Assist are specific to suicide intervention and, and, and prevention. Um, what's the difference between the two? Why are there two? Well, because the audience is slightly different. Um, Safe Talk is a half day course. Assist is a two day course. Safe Talk is intended for individuals who um, might identify others who are thinking of suicide or others who might have thoughts of suicide, and then they want to feel comfortable approaching them, confirming those thoughts, and then um, engaging them with a professional, an appropriate professional to help. Um, so they're going to do pretty quickly a, a warm handoff to someone else. That's why it's a, a, a half day course. Assist is really more intended for individuals who are going to also identify individuals who might be having thoughts of suicide. Um, but then they're also going to work with them, spend some time with them to develop uh, what we refer to as a safety plan. So that intervention is a little bit longer than is the intervention of someone who's trained in safe talk. So that's why that's a two day, two day course. Um, they pair nicely, those two courses pair nicely with mental health first aid. Mental health first aid is sort of a broad explanation of mental health um, conditions. Um, and so what I find oftentimes people will ask about, um, I, I encourage them to first attend a mental health first aid course so that they can get that broad based understanding of mental health. And then if they are interested at that point in narrowing their focus, their learning opportunity to suicide, uh, prevention intervention, at that point in time, they might want to consider a safe talk or assist course. We offer those as well. <clears throat> I think if there's enough interest in mental health first aid, um, we might have our internal representative, who is Heather Brown, um, come to the team, come to the board and, and um, uh, give a talk and talk about that and see if there could be some additional offerings at that point in time. But today, I'm just going to be focusing on, on mental health first aid. And to that, I do really want to make certain that everybody understands our intention today. Um, I am providing a high level overview of mental health first aid. And the reason I'm doing this is to kind of gauge interest amongst those of you who are in attendance to see if there is justification for us perhaps uh, to set up a future mental health first aid session. Um, so that's why today is just an overview. Um, if we do determine that there is going to be enough interest to, um, to have a, a session um, for the organization, then I'll coordinate that through Jose. We'll talk more about that toward the end of our time today. Um, so I just want to be very, very clear. Today is not a mental health first aid session in and of itself. Um, there are no CEUs. There's no certificates that are going to be granted as a result of your attendance today. So.
Um, so let me talk to you. Uh, let me begin narrowing my focus and talking to you specifically about mental health first aid. First thing I, I like to do is always provide you with a source where you can continue the conversation after our conversation ends today. That source would be mentalhealthfirstaid.org if you'd like to read more about the program. Um, and um, I, I don't know if everybody's in Arizona. I, sometimes I wind up with folks in clouds who are around Arizona uh, and outside of Arizona as well. So you can also go to that website if you're interested in, in finding sessions and, and perhaps signing up for them. If you're in remote areas of Arizona, you're calling in today from outside of Arizona. That website will also give you some additional information about the program. I'm gonna to talk to you about a lot of the, the basics of the program today. Um, and what I'd like to do now at this point is just recalculate a bit. I've been doing a lot of talking and so I'd like to ask you all some questions. Um, First question is, how many of you are trained in CPR? If you're trained in CPR, you can respond. I see, oh, some hand raises, excellent. That's a great option, thank you. Okay, we got a good, oh, wow, look at everybody, all the responses, that's fantastic. Excellent. Okay, so now I'm gonna, you can lower your hands if you like. Um, I'm gonna ask you a slightly different question. Um, how many of you are trained in um, first aid? How many of you are trained in first aid? Slightly different. Okay, looks like excellent. Good number of individuals as well. Fantastic. That's great to see. Fantastic. Thank you. So my next question to you is if you were not or if you are not trained in CPR and first aid, would you feel confident to be able to step in and assist someone who might be in a medical crisis? If you didn't have that training, would you be comfortable doing that? Maybe you work in healthcare, so you'd be like, yeah, I could do that. But um, how many of you would be comfortable without that training? So yeah, that number is a significantly lower. Yeah, I, I would expect that to be the case. Thanks for that, that feedback. You know, the thing that's interesting about CPR and first aid is that you actually have to wait until the crisis is in process before administering it. I mean, you're not gonna look across the room and think, hmm, I think that person's about to have a heart attack um, and, and rush over to them and begin administering um, chest compressions and, and potentially risk cracking their ribs or something like that. You're not gonna rush across the room with a bandage and start to place a tourniquet on somebody's arm because you think that they might be in a medical crisis. You need to wait and you need to respond once that crisis has happened, right? So from that perspective, CPR and first aid oftentimes is considered an intervention program because you intervene once that crisis has started. Um, similar to a medical crisis, you know, a lot of people don't feel confident um, stepping in and helping out if somebody has a, a particular mental health need. Um, and in addition to not feeling confident, a lot of times people don't feel comfortable stepping in and helping somebody who might be in a mental health crisis. And a lot of that, a lot of that discomfort comes, it's rooted in the stigma and the stereotype of, of mental illness. Um, people witnessing someone might think, oh, gosh, is it safe for me to approach this person? Are they okay to approach? What if they attack me? What if I get hurt? Those are some of the things that might go through the minds of people who are witnessing somebody else perhaps struggling. And because of those thoughts, and those thoughts oftentimes arise from what we think we know to be true, the things we make up um, about mental health and, and mental illness, we sometimes don't feel not only um, confident, but we don't feel comfortable stepping in. So mental health first aid comes along and it offers an action plan, a realistic action plan that individuals can utilize to help build confidence so that they can step in and they can help an individual who might be in some type of a um, mental health crisis. Um, we also, because we try to dispel some of the myths, people also feel comfortable stepping in as, um, as well. 
And the other thing that I think is interesting about mental health first aid is um, unlike CPR and first aid, you can provide the help before the individual is in crisis, right? Particularly if we utilize what we refer to as our noticing skills. We encourage people who go through mental health first aid to live their life um, in such a way that you're noticing what's going on about you. And if you've got really good, if you're really in tune with your noticing skills, you might notice somebody's struggling before they get to a crisis point. And if you notice that, then you can step in and, and utilize the action plan and maybe assist that person before the situation escalates to a point that it's actually a crisis. So in many ways, mental health first aid could be considered a, a, a prevention program. So trust me, you're not going to you're not going to crack anybody's ribs uh, by stepping in and offering mental health first aid and asking them if if they're okay. Um, so it, it it's okay to utilize mental health first aid not only as an intervention program but also as a prevention program as well. So let's talk more about mental health first aid. Um, let's unpack it a bit. Some things I want to unpack is the background of mental health first aid so you understand where it came from. Um, the course itself, what's covered, and then the learning experience for those who, who attend, and as well as some of the benefits for it. So let's have that discussion now. Let's begin with the background of mental health first aid. Uh, mental health first aid itself was developed in the country of Australia. It was developed by a husband and wife team. They both are clinicians and educators, so they're very well versed in um, in assisting individuals and encountering individuals um, who are in a medical crisis, as well as individuals who are in a mental health crisis as well. Um, this team, they hypothesized, they suspected that if you know, we can take an average lay person and teach them, give them the skills, the tools, the knowledge, um, the confidence and the comfort to approach somebody who's in a medical crisis, maybe we could do the same. Uh, for a layperson and teach them, give them the confidence and the comfort level to approach somebody who's in a mental health crisis as well, or who might be struggling. Again, we don't have to wait until they're in a crisis to administer mental health first aid like we would have to do first aid or CPR. So they sat down, they put pen to paper at the time, which is probably pretty true. Uh, they put pen to paper um, and they created a course. And they set out, as we often do in this field, is, and they began to pilot that course. Um, they had wonderful success around um, Australia. Um, they um, finalized the course in about 2001 there in, in Australia. Um, and um, given the success that they had, um, the course eventually went global. There was lots of interest in the world there was interest also here in the United States. Um, in the United States, it, it came here by way of the National Council for Mental Wellbeing in about 2007. Um, and it, all states had access to it. Anybody who was interested in the United States had ac access to mental first aid. Um, in the, in, um, here in Arizona, um, we had a lot of interest starting in about 2011. It was already here, it was present, people were utilizing it, but interest grew significantly in 2011. Can anybody think about what might have happened in 2011 that might have grown that interest? Whitney, I, I see your hand is up. I don't know if we can. Someone asked, uh, was it because of 9-11? No, that's a good, that's a very reasonable yeah, conclusion. It wasn't because of 9-11, no. Um, no, something else. Something else happened in 2011. It was specific to Arizona. This the event. recession? No, it wasn't the recession, no. It was specific to Tucson. Oh, uh, yeah. somewhat. Maria said less shelters. Um, less shelter. Um, yeah, Leah. The the Tucson shootings. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The um, the Tucson shootings. Yeah. When that happened, 
state leadership, healthcare state leadership said, hey, if somebody had seen something and if they knew to do something in advance, maybe the outcome could have been different. The state leadership began looking around to seeing what could we do to increase awareness and provide community education around mental health and prevention and intervention. And they eventually landed on mental health first aid. And so at that point in time, access um, got involved. They got very involved in bringing um, mental health first aid offerings here to, to the state. Um, and certainly the health plans did, did as well. So since Mercy Care is an access health plan, um, that's about the, the time that we ourselves also got involved as well. Um, so we saw a great increase in mental health utilization here in Arizona anyway. Um, following the, the the Tucson shootings, yeah. So there's a little connection there um, from Arizona to Medell's first aid. A little bit about the background. Let's talk about the course. The course itself, as I indicated earlier, it presents a five-step action plan. Um, individuals who complete the training, we refer to them as first aiders. The action plan itself is referred to as ALGI. That's um, that's an acronym for assess, listen. Uh, give reassurance and advice, um, encourage appropriate professional help, and encourage self-help. Um, so that's what the acronym ALGE stands for. Um, and we teach that up front in the course. Um, because the course is from Australia, we also have a koala bear who attends the course with us. It's a stuffed koala bear um, who's the mascot for the program as well. So it's fun to have ALGE. Um, that's, that's the name of the koala bear as well. It's fun to have algae in the course with us. I, I use algae a lot of times to encourage people to practice what they might say to someone. Um, looking into the eyes of, of, of a koala bear is, I think, a little easier <laughs> to practice what you're going to say than it is to perhaps look into the eyes of, of, of an individual, especially the first time you're practicing saying something or asking the question. Um, uh, the course also includes data for mental health statistics here in the United States, uh, both national and local data is included. So we encourage local um, facilitators to consider the state, um, the area, the county, the city that they're in. And if they can bring and augment um, national information that's provided. That way we can build greater relevance for learners. We know as adults that having relevance to the information we're receiving is, is, is very important. So we encourage provider or um, encourage instructors to, to to bring that relevance to the course. Um, we then review common mental health conditions, such as some of the ones we talked about: depression, anxiety, uh, panic, substance use. We do talk a bit about psychosis, um, and then again, we do scratch the surface on suicide um, as well. So we talk about those conditions. We present a condition. Um, we then um, talk about the signs and symptoms of those, of that particular condition. And then before we turn our attention to another condition, we stop, we pause, and we reconsider algae. We, we, we reconsider that action plan. And how does that action plan look? How would it look different for somebody who, if we're talking about depression versus anxiety at that moment, how, why, how would you respond differently as a mental health first aider if you're trying to assist somebody who might be in a state of, of, of depression? We're very cautious to let our first aiders know you're not diagnosing, you're not a clinical professional. If you couldn't diagnose before you walked in the classroom, you can't diagnose now. Um, so language is important. So we don't want our first aiders telling someone that, hey, I think you have depression. Um, so we encourage people to, to use appropriate language as they're interfacing with individuals that they're, they're trying to assist. But once we talk about a condition and we learn about the signs and symptoms, we take a look at some of the data around it, then, and, and then we take a look at algae, we wrap it up, and then we move on to the next condition. So algae is presented at the very beginning, and then it's repeatedly reviewed throughout the course as well. So by the time the course ends, people are hopefully very comfortable and confident in their ability to utilize this action plan that we refer to as, as, um, as algae. Um, it's important to know that the course itself is supported as evidence-based by SAMHSA. SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Um, they are here in the U.S. 
Um, they drive a lot of policy and practices, best practices in the mental health and substance use um, arena. So it's important for learners to know that this is considered evidence-based um, practice, this protocol and the action plan. Um, not only does it have um, evidence-based stamp of approval, it also has stamp of approval from, from peers. It's gone through peer review. And I think a lot of times in the corporate world, when we talk about peer review, we're talking about another colleague um, has reviewed um, and, and, and provided their input. In the world of mental health, when we talk about peer review, we're oftentimes talking about, when we reference the, the term peer, we're talking about somebody with lived experience with mental illness. So the course itself has been reviewed by individuals who have lived experience and, and are continuing to live with mental, mental illness conditions. They've reviewed the course and they've also given it um, a, a stamp of approval as well. It, it can be a, effective and appropriate for dissemination. Um, and finally, there's multiple versions of the course. So when we talk about mental health first aid, there's actually a few different versions. The ones I'm most familiar with are adult, youth, and first responders, because those are the ones in which I'm certified. There's recently been a development of a teen course, which is slightly, slightly different than, than the youth. Um, there's other um, types of mental health first aiders, but, but these are the ones that are the most common. The core course is really considered adult and youth. Um, the rest of the courses, um, I would say they're probably 80, 85% similar to adult and youth. Um, just where necessary, you swap out information um, and data um, specific to the, the population that the course is, is, um, is addressing. But predominantly, the, the experience is very, is very similar. Um, so now let's talk about the experience. That's about the course. Let's talk about the experience as a learner. Um, the course is definitely um, facilitated by a nationally certified trainer through the National Council of Mental Wellbeing. Uh, it's a full day's experience. It takes about, about eight hours to complete um, from beginning to end. So it does take a time commitment. This isn't something that can be done on a, on a lunch and learn. Um, and there aren't quick, fast versions of this. Uh, about the only version we, this is the only version that we have. We don't have a shortened version. Um, um, so we have the, the, the eight hour version that, that is available. It is a full day's experience. And again, it does take a certain amount of, of, of commitment. Preferably individual, uh, um, individuals attending are, volun um, are, are volunteers. Um, it's through volunteer attendance as opposed to people being voluntold to, um, to attend. Um, and that's an important factor. So when organizations reach out to me and say, hey, we'd like to have a session, one of the, the, the um, questions I ask them is whether or not they are making this a requirement, a mandate, or if it's um, a volunteer experience. Some instances they've, they've said, oh no, we want everybody to go through this. And, and I caution them to rethink that. Um, a lot of what we talk about um, could be traumatizing or it could be re-traumatizing. Um, employers, um, don't know the personal lives of the people who work for them. They don't know what happens um, at home. They don't know what's happening in the personal lives of the people that work for them and their friends and family's lives, right? They don't know what they're exposed to. So I encourage providers not to make mental health first aid a requirement for anybody. Um, I can understand that organizations would want to encourage people to attend. And if they're going to offer multiple sessions, they can approach attendance from the perspective of um, we're going to offer this. And when you're ready, you can enroll in a session of your choice, as opposed to saying we're offering it. This is the session you're going to attend. That's a much different approach because we need to honor um, individuals who might be experiencing trauma. And, and we don't want to re-traumatize anybody by going through this learning experience. So that's usually a, a point at which I try to have um, a very specific conversation with people who are, who are requesting um, a mental health first aid session. Um, the structure of the course um, is, uh, we, it certainly includes it's didactic. There's some lecture, there's some conversation, um, there's some sharing, some storytelling. Um, there's team activities, there's movies, there's scenarios. Um, it's a course that people aren't gonna be sitting in their their seat all day long, which I think is a good thing considering the, the, the length of it. 
attendees do receive course material that they reference during the course and they also take with them so they can have it after the course as well. At the conclusion of the course, they do receive a certificate. It's good for three years. They're certified as a mental health first aider. Um, at the end of three years, similar to CPR first aid, they just sign up for another mental health first aid course and they get um, their certification extended for another three years. So that's a little bit about the experience. Um, I, I want to finish up, kind of begin rounding out our conversation today about talking about the benefit. What, what's the benefit to a mental health first aid course? And in thinking of this, I thought of three different populations, benefits to learners, employers, and persons at risk. Um, some of the benefits to learners, and, and, and I could go on and on about all of these. So the, the information I'm sharing isn't um, specific only to what I'm sharing. There's lots of, of, of other responses. But um, a benefit to a learner, um, number one, especially considering the, the group that, that I'm speaking to, which, which might include people who are, are job seekers, um, it's a great way to build your resume, right? If you're looking for work in mental health or healthcare, um, having the experience of mental health first aid um, could be something that might set you apart from another potential applicant. So it could really be considered a resume builder. Um, it's also helpful to just build our confidence, right? Build our self-efficacy, our belief in ourselves that we can be successful. And that's really important if we're looking for a job. Job seekers need to have that level of, of confidence, that level of self-efficacy, um, being able to, to be successful, right? Um, and then um, also to the learner, there's just the added benefit of being able to help those individuals who might be at risk. Um, certainly people at risk might be friends or family, but sometimes people at risk might be our coworkers, right? Depending upon the field in which we work, some fields carry a little more stress and burnout um, than do others. And so it might be helpful just as a independent contributor on a team to have that experience of mental health first aid. So th those are some basic benefits to a learner in attendance. To an employer, some of the benefits could include the fact that it shows your commitment toward building safer work communities. Um, and it also allows you to empower managers and, and leaders. A lot of employers who've reached out um, to me, um, and they're from all walks of life. They're not all mental health employers. Um, some of them are very far away from the mental health field. Um, a few of them are employers that have um, call centers. Call centers are known to be high stress, high anxiety um, places to work. So they've decided to train their um, management staff who work in the call centers um, because they want them to be able to have well-equipped noticing skills, be able to notice when maybe some of their staff may not be responding as they typically respond, may not be working as they, as, as they usually work, um, maybe they're beginning to show signs and symptoms of stress and anxiety and depression, and they want their managers, their, their leaders to be able to reach out to take a preventive stand uh, before a situation gets to a point that they have to intervene. Um, other employers um, have also, uh, in addition to training management and leadership, they've also looked at their security teams as well. Because security, security teams in corporate environments are oftentimes first responders. They might arrive before an actual community first responder arrives. So some employers have chosen to, to train their, um, their, security, their security teams as well. So lots of wonderful benefits to employer to consider having a mental health first aid session. And then finally, some um, benefits to persons at, at risk. Um, persons at risk who live in a community where they know that, that um, mental health first aid is supported, um, they recognize that they have greater access to resources um, just at, at, at a moment's notice. Um, and it also helps lessen stigma and stereotyping in the community in, in which they live because they know people are gonna have a better understanding of their life circumstances and their lived experiences. So these are some basic benefits for these audiences I'd just like to share with you all. Um, so that's a, a little bit about um, the program, um, the experience, the, the benefits. Um, so what happens with, with scheduling? Um, to schedule a session um, for fidelity of the course, we do need to have between 12 and 30 learners present. Um, we simply need to have space to host. Typically we need um, 
tables and chairs so people can be comfortable. We need move. Uh, we need room to move about the room. Um, I've shown up in some instances where people have <clears throat> almost um, um, utilized a closet um, for their training room for their their training experience. Um, I had one person um, when I showed up, they joked and they said, "Oh yeah, our um, our colleagues like one another. They like to get cozy with one another. They'll be fine." Um, and as a as a a trainer, I show fidelity to the program and I tell them, no, that's not going to happen. I need you to go through this list. I need you to remove two tables and I need you to cut this list down in, in half and we can schedule a separate session. We can't do all of these folks in this one room at this particular time. So it's important that they have room to move about so they, they can complete the exercises. They can, it, it's an awful long day to sit for eight hours. Some people might want to get up and just go to the back of the room and stand, so forth. So we, we, I'm a particular stickler when it comes to the size of the room and, and what's available in the room. Um, we also need access to AV equipment. <clears throat> it's helpful. Um, I have a rolling cart that I, I take um, a projector around with and my laptop. So I can have it covered, but if there's... Um, um, since mine, my equipment is more um, remote, if there's permanent equipment in the room, sometimes that works out a little bit better. There is a cost to mental health first aid, but it's all covered by Mercy Care, so nobody's going to receive a bill. The only cost might be is if whoever hosts decides to bring in snacks or if they decide to bring in lunch or, or, or something like that. Uh, typically, we take an hour for lunch, but what I'll do is if, if the host um, brings in lunch, then um, since lunch is readily available, I oftentimes will cut that down to about a half of an hour. Um, <clears throat> I, so I kind of leave it up to, to the host to tell me what their expectation on that is. I've had some hosts, I do this a lot for churches, um, and churches um, actually just love to have a picnic, or uh, no, not a picnic, a potluck, um, which is a great solution. So that way they don't have to spend money. Um, so there's lots of different ways to get around that particular lunchtime need. And if necessary, if we take an hour because folks need to go out, then we can certainly take an hour as well. Totally up, uh, up to the host and, and the learners and whatever's most convenient for them. We do need to, con to select a convenient date. Um, usually for me, if I'm, if I'm facilitating, it needs to be at least six weeks out because I am a facilitator and my schedule is filled with classes. I teach probably about 12 to 15 different courses. Um, so I'm at any given notice, my, my schedule is already full. So for me, I need at least minimum six weeks out before I can begin considering um, scheduling a course. So um, sort of the, the next steps is based upon our conversation today, if people think that they're interested, I think you're going to reach out to Jose, you send Jose um, an email, let him know that you're interested. Um, at a certain point in time, I think Jose will gather those emails. He'll tally them up, see how many we have. Um, he'll reach back out to me and let me know, hey, Mike, we've got X number. Um, what can we do? Um, and Jose and I will, will begin kind of the, the next steps, the, the, the next phases at that particular point. Um, and so that brings me to my final slide, which is always questions, concerns, comments, or complaints. <laughs> All right. Uh, one of the questions we received, Mike, uh, which I think is relevant during this current time that we're living in, uh, can it can this training be virtual? Sorry, I was drinking there. Um, yeah, there is a virtual option. Um, <clears throat> the virtual option is um, slightly different. Um, it obviously. Um, you're not gathered together in, in, in one location. The way that that works is there's pre-work that has to be done. Um, there's um, an assignment. I think it takes about four hours to complete the pre-work. Individuals who don't complete the pre-work are not admitted into the, the live virtual classroom. Those people who do complete it are admit, admitted to the live virtual classroom. And so then the virtual classroom is used to review a lot of the information that was discussed, kind of springboard, if you will, conversations from what was um, presented in the, um, the homework. Um, there's additional um, um, media that we look at, movies and, and, and things such as that. Um, and that piece 
is also about four hours in length, four to five hours in length. So th the time frame is very much the same. Um, um, the commitment is very much the same, whether it's done virtual or whether it's done um, uh, in person. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, we have in the comments as well, uh, from Marcella, she said <clears throat> HSC has space for training and may have interest in offering or hosting this training for others or for their foster parents. Uh, they're the ones who informed her of this opportunity and she gave some contact information. So what we'd like to do, um, Mike, if you can pass me the ball, I have a slide that I sure, want to share sure. with my contact information so that folks have it. All right. Thank you so much. This is great information. Great information. All right, Mike, I'm still waiting uh, for the host role, if you can. Oh, I see. Yeah, I turned it back to you. So let's do this again. <clears throat> There we go. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so let's go back to here. All right. So on the screen, and what we would like to do is I have my contact information, my email, rojasj2 at mercycare.org. And what I'm asking, if anyone is interested in participating in this sort of training, please send me your name, your email, your phone. If you're part of an organization, please put that. If you're just a job seeker and you want another tool on your resume or toolbox, please indicate that. And what I'll do is um, we'll, we'll give it a couple of weeks to gather the information and I'll connect with Mike. And like I said, if we're in fidelity to host a training, Mike and I will connect and, and figure out how we can do so. And it would be our pleasure to do that uh, for those on the call and we can work that out. If we don't have enough people interested in the training, let's say we get less than the fidelity, I will give those that information to Mike and he will reach out to people as trainings become available to plug you into those that are currently occurring. So we have two options. If we have enough people, we could host our own. If uh, we don't have enough people interested, no worries. We will get you connected to future trainings. But in order to start that ball rolling, I would need that email. So please email me at the email address on your screen with your name, your email, your phone number, organization, if you're currently employed or affiliated with an organization, or if you're a job seeker, let us know. And uh, Mike and I will connect in a few weeks to see where we are with the interest. And then we'll move forward from there. And we'll have all the contact information we need. So if we can get one scheduled, we would reach out and let you guys know. Uh, let me check, uh, Sherry, anything else in the Q&A coming up? Nope, the only thing, we did have a question from early on and that was, and I, something I wondered about as well, that um, information about the most prevalent um, disorder right now, is that, was that taken um, before COVID or during? Um, Liz had a question whether that was, is anxiety still more prevalent now during and after COVID? Sure. So that was taken, the comorbidity survey was, that particular version was taken before COVID. The other thing I, <clears throat> I point out too is that when you look at data, um, because of stereotyping stigma, people just don't get services. So I think any percent we look at is probably lower than the reality. So I think all of those percentages are far greater because um, we know that um, the prevalence for individuals to reach out and ask for help is, is much less for people who are reaching out to mental health um, clinics and, and places. Um, I, I look forward to the day when nobody works, when nobody walks into a healthcare clinic or a mental health clinic, we all walk into a well-being clinic. Nobody's gonna know why you're there. There's nobody's gonna know if you're at that well-being clinic for your for your head or your heart or your lung or your whatever the case may be um so um yeah so all of that those statistics are prior to covid all that right. is all the questions 
All right. Well, again, uh, Mike, thank you for this great information. I'm sure we're going to get great interest uh, on it. Uh, thank you again. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, so for those of you on the call, our next couple of steps is, like I said, uh, NEPA is going to be strategizing uh, towards the end of the year to offer some new exciting uh, offerings to our NEPA membership, our community partners, anyone who's interested in joining NEPA for 2023. So in order to help us do that, we got a couple of things on board right now. Uh, we created a quick little poll uh, that we're gonna present to you. And if you can uh, take the opportunity to answer those questions, I think it's about four questions. And then Leah is gonna ask uh, a, of you a few questions and Sherry's gonna take some notes so we could take that back and sort of uh, look at next year and how we wanna offer some uh, valuable uh, resources and some value to you guys. Um, so let's see, and then please bear with me. This is my first time I created a poll on, on Zoom, so I'm hoping it works. So I'm gonna launch this poll. Let's see. All right. I see you should see a poll come up. Hopefully you have it. And it's a uh, multiple choice. It's four questions. Uh, please take the opportunity to answer these questions. Um, I see we have about 24 people in attendance right now. Please, if you see the poll come up, please take the opportunity to answer these questions. Sherry, Leah, are you guys seeing the poll at all? Yes. yes. All right. Yay, people are answering. Woo, I was nervous because it took and a the minute. the answers are coming up? Yay, I'm so Ooh. excited. All right. Thank you guys so much. This is really going to help us give you guys value. Uh, we understand that uh, a lot of you today, especially... Uh, in the provider field and, and you're taking time from your day to get this valuable information. So we just wanna provide value. We really wanna grow our community and give everyone value for attending NEPA. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this. All right, we have, we're almost done. We got four more people needing to respond. Ooh, we're cranking it out. You guys are awesome. Thank you for this. All right, we have two more people. If you wanna respond, please feel free. And then I'll end the poll. We'll give you about another minute or so. And then Leah's gonna just lead a quick discussion with some more questions uh, that we couldn't put in the poll because unfortunately the poll was multiple choice. So these are like sort of open-ended answers. So please feel free to answer them in your Q&A as, as uh, Leah puts them up. And Sherry, to make it easier for you, you can just pull up the Q&A and cut and paste into a Word doc. That might be easiest. All right, everyone participated. I'm gonna end the poll. Thank you so much. All right. So Leah, I will give it off to you. Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you, Jose. Good day, everyone, and happy Friday. So glad that you're with us today. So thanks for hanging out for the last few minutes. We can call this the after show, if you will. Uh, just wanted to ask you a few follow-up questions, as Jose mentioned, just to help our board plan a little bit better. And so feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourselves and uh, just engage in the, per in the conversation. And if you would prefer, you can also put your responses in the chat box. Uh, in regards to the second question that was just introduced in the poll, just because our polling uh, feature was rather limited, when it, we we're talking about virtual, in-person, or hybrid sessions, it'd be helpful for us to know, does this time of day work for you, for example? Do you prefer maybe for... Uh, some of you, you might take an early lunch. Maybe if you're like Sherry and you're in a different time zone, this is lunchtime. Or do you prefer an after hours event or a weekend event maybe? I mean, anything is possible at this point as we brainstorm, we talk, we strategize. So love to hear from you. What time of day works best for meetings such as this? Thank you for your feedback in the Q&A box. 
Yes, we have this time was fine. Uh, day hours are best. This is a good time and day. Right now is fine for me, but I'm flexible. Uh, this time, perfect daytime this time. Okay. So it looks like uh, this time works for, for the majority who are responding. And you know what yes. we'll probably, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, Jose. I was gonna say what we'll probably do is we'll also take this feedback to those who are listed as members most likely and also try to reach out to them in another way since they weren't able to attend today. And I wanna make sure that their feedback is also considered within our uh, participation. So again, appreciate your feedback in that regard. Now for question number three that we put in our polling feature, we asked what tools are most valuable to you between NetPub meetings. And we only included, even though we asked you for multiple tools, we only let you select one. So if there are additional tools that you use in addition to the NetPA website, the NetPA LinkedIn channel, the YouTube channel, Twitter, or Facebook, feel free to include that information now as well. Again, chat box, Q&A box, unmute yourself, raise your, raise your hands. We're flexible here. We have one vote for YouTube. <laughs> And maybe if we didn't identify a platform that you use on a regular basis or that you feel comfortable with, whether it be a social media channel or a Teams-like channel, maybe where we could engage in conversation together, like um, Teams externally, if you will, that's something we could consider. So don't feel limited to those choices as well. Okay, I see two votes for YouTube and uh, one individual doesn't use social media. So the NEPPA website is helpful. Good feedback. Thank you. All right, another vote for YouTube. We might have to ask some of you YouTubers out there for some content. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. And why not, right? If you have content you'd like to add, maybe that's something that we talk about in terms of maybe membership being mm -hmm. able to provide content you all might have things going on with your employers or in your job search that might benefit others so maybe that's something to consider too so tell me a little bit more about why you all decided to attend today's NEPPA meeting was it the topic was it the speaker was it you hadn't attended in a while and wanted to check in was this a good day and time or maybe it was something else All right, we got one for topic. Woohoo. Mike's presentation was great. Uh, we got another one for topic. Okay. Yeah, and just an FYI, we are we are uh, we are aware that you know our topics uh, range widely. So every month we might have a different audience. So so thank mm -hmm. you for that. And if you even want to maybe in your Q&A add a topic that might be of interest to you, that might be helpful as well. Definitely. We have, Thank you for that, Jose. We have Fiona who said she was invited and encouraged by Tim Stump. So Tim, you get uh, kudos from me for that. Um, we have someone that wants to learn more about mental health. Um, CPR and first aid is an interest of somebody. Another one was today's topic. Sherry, am I am I uh, moving too fast on the Q and A for you? I was going to say if if you don't if don't delete them, I'll delete them when I get them copied. If you okay, don't mind. thank Perfect. you. Perfect. I was just trying to help you out. I noticed I'm going a little fast on it. Sorry. All right. So I'll let I'll let you handle that. Okay, so and again, if you think of something after we've covered a question, if you just let us know which one you're responding to, we can keep all of these open as we go. So don't feel pressured to uh, put something in before we move on. In regards to NEPA current state, what are we doing well? Where do you see a connection to NEPA? Uh, what gravitates you towards NEPA? Where can we potentially continue doing something that we're doing now, but make it better? 
Um, and again, just let's think about current state and then we'll talk about maybe opportunities. Right, and if this is your, your first meeting with us and you don't know too much about us, you can talk about uh, what you would like to see as well. Exactly. Because I know one of the things we are discussing as a board is maybe offering some more training, uh, you know, maybe some reskilling, maybe various topics, you know, um, typically we've always been an hour and a half meeting every month, but we have flexibility. So if we want to offer trainings that might be longer in the future, if it presents value and has interest to the folks that are involved in NEPA, we are looking to do that as well. So um, please consider that. And maybe you're a long-standing member or you've been acquainted with NEPA for many years and you just come because it's on your calendar. And that's okay to say that too. I mean, we're creatures of habit sometimes. So if we see the email come through, we register, we put it on our calendars, that's great. So be thinking about that too. All right. Someone put uh, promoting finding a job that wants someone feels passionate about. Um, if you have or know people that are looking for jobs, when we have our employer panels, just to give you a little insight on that, it's a very informal discussion and it's not a typical employer interview. I really ask these employers to talk about their culture, what their day to day is like, how they work with folks with challenges and barriers, uh, people that might have a criminal background, people that might have a mental health background. And we really ask these employers to talk about, because uh, we all know currently the gas prices, inflation, things are out of control. And, and sometimes employers may not be able to offer a higher salary. So we ask them to talk about what else they can offer if they're not able to offer a higher pay rate. And a lot of them cover college, uh, personal growth, professional growth. So uh, if you're interested, again, we do have a YouTube channel and we post all our videos on there as well as our website. So check out some of our employer panels. I think you'll be surprised to see that we do things a little differently. All right, well, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on. But again, feel free to put information in the chat box if something comes to you after we move on. Um, I know that we kind of spun this one into the last one, but in case you were waiting or if you have anything to add, what would you like to see NEPA offer that might make your membership or part participation more valuable? Maybe something that we're not offering now that maybe another group offers that you really um, have grown to like, or maybe something that you say as an employer or as a training professional, I would want to see this. And at one time we talked about a newsletter and there was some interest in a newsletter featuring maybe employers, maybe giving a helpful tip for the month or the quarter, depending on how frequently it would be published. It's not that we have forgotten about that. It's just that we wanna make it valuable. Now we don't wanna put something together that's not relevant. Rick has oh, so a question much. being, yeah, yeah, being new, do you have panel discussions with members providing feedback? This is something we did uh, last year. We ran a couple of focus groups with employers and also job seekers to see what they're interested in. And I think we can do another round of those if, if there was a call for that. Yeah, we're, we're very open right now to uh, really making NEPA the best resource we could be. So everything is on the table, um, looking at uh, how we structure our meetings, all of those things. So please, any feedback you could provide, we're gonna take a look at it and we're gonna discuss. All funny right, dog right. videos. <laughs> <laughs> I love funny dog videos. I don't get enough of them. All right, next question. What questions do you have about NEPA that are currently unanswered? Maybe you have a question about our mission. Maybe you have a question about what we do on a regular basis. Maybe you have a question about 
the meeting times or the meeting formats, like Jose said. Great question, Fiona. In terms of NetPuzz history, why and when did it start? If you haven't already, I would invite you to check out our website, uh, nepaaz.org, I believe it is. And there's some more information on that website about its history. And I'm just going to check that to make sure that I have it correct. Yes, nepaaz.com, excuse me. Dot com, yes. We have a long history within the Phoenix area, and that's something we've talked about as a panel also. Do we want to expand our reach, maybe um, regionally, maybe within the, uh, yeah, exactly, nationally? Yeah, NEPA has been around since 1992, just to give you some perspective. So it's been 30 years uh, that NEPA has been around. And I know a lot of our founders were still with us and are still with us. And it's nice to see that they kind of built a legacy that they continue to believe in. All right, last question. And we so appreciate you all participating. So thank you for the input you've already provided. And if you'd like to connect with Jose offline, I know he's included his contact information. You can also connect with me if you would like to talk offline. Uh, my email address is hill, H-I-L-L dot Leah, L-E-A-H at mayo dot E-D-U. And I put it in the chat box, but unfortunately, I don't think you'll all see it. So uh, go ahead and take note of that or feel free to stay online after we all disconnect if you'd like to talk with any of us privately. But last question is, what questions or comments do you have that we didn't address here today or that you would like to make note of to the group, whether that be your fellow participants or to the board? All right. Well, thank you again for your participation and don't hesitate to reach out to any of us offline. All three of us are also available on LinkedIn, so you can connect with us that way too. And we look forward to hopefully, um, oh, I know more opportunity is coming, but is it possible to get like continuing education or continuing, uh, I guess, continuing education or education unit credits? I want to just clarify, or are we talking like educational academic credits? Good thoughts, Rick. We appreciate you wanting to learn more. So let us know at any time if we can provide any information to you that you're not able to find through other channels. All right. Well, again, uh... Thank you all for your feedback. I'm just gonna share a few more slides with some resources before we wrap this meeting up. So give me one second and I'll get them up. All right. All right, so again, there is my contact information. If you're interested in pursuing uh, this training, we're excited to pair with Mercy Care to offer it if you are interested. Uh, but here's a couple of uh, free resources for anyone seeking jobs. And also, if you're a part of an organization that's struggling to fill positions, you could use these resources as well. Arizona at Work, they offer a plethora of resources for both the job seeker and those individual uh, organizations that are struggling to fill positions. They can host job fairs. They can post positions. They offer classes on resumes, uh, career exploration. They have resources for individuals that might not have the resources to do resumes and print them out and, and do job search. So Arizona at Work is a great uh, resource. Arizona Job Connection is also a great resource for both organizations and job seekers as well. And again, if uh, you want the weekly job blast, 
All you have to do is text AZ at work to 22828. And you're going to get a text back that's ask you for your email or information. And then you're going to get weekly job blasts. And this is great uh, for those who are on the call, who are currently seeking employment, or those who are just interested to see what's going on in the world of employment and see what opportunities are out there. This is a great one for you. Last but not least, let's talk about our August presentation. We are super excited. Uh, we are going to have uh, registered apprenticeships, uh, Arizona Apprenticeship Office speaking about registered apprenticeship opportunities for businesses and job seekers here in Arizona. And then we're going to have Sherry talk about Riker Hamilton and the national level of apprenticeship possibilities. So if you are affiliated with an organization that is struggling to get employees and fill positions, and you are pretty much wearing the title of three different employees, get your employer on our next meeting so they can uh, develop some ways to get some more talent in. So again, this is going to happen Friday, August 19th. It's from 10 to 1130. You can register on our website. Typically, just so you know, our, our website is updated with the meeting for the, pre, for the next month, about the first week of every month. So uh, give us a couple of weeks to update it uh, with the new information, and then you can register there. So thank you so much. And with that being said, we'd like to say thank you again for participating. Have a great weekend, everyone, and thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Take care.